Hello and welcome to our time of worship together. It's lovely that you could join us. Thank you for being part of our church today. I hope that as we explore the miracle of the parting of the Red Sea, you have an opportunity to think about the miracles in your life, the big ones and the little ones, and are encouraged to spend some time in prayer or meditation or just a time of quiet, to look around and see the little ways that God is present and working miracles in our world around us all the time. We're going to start our time of worship together as we have been doing the last few weeks and will continue to do by saying together our prayer of Moses. Let's pray together. When we can only see what is before us, Lord, lift our eyes to see beyond. When we can only see what is around us, lift our eyes to see beyond. When we can only see all that we have lost, Lord, lift our eyes to see beyond. When we can only see change and upheaval, Lord, lift our eyes to see beyond. Show us, O Lord, how far we have come. Remind us of how you have stayed with us all that way. Reassure us that you still walk beside us. Restore our faith in all the new things you reveal and the new paths in which you lead us. And though we may not recognise the places we now inhabit, may we trust in your goodness, which is for every generation. Lord, Lift our eyes to see beyond. Amen. I was thinking the other day about World War II and I was thinking about Dunkirk. You see, when the soldiers found themselves on the beach hemmed in at all side by the Nazis, they needed a miracle and they prayed for a miracle. And a miracle came, but it wasn't the miracle they were expecting, because the miracle came in the form of little boats, of rowboats and sailboats, of creelers and tugboats, of yachts and pleasure craft that came across and were able to help ship out all those stranded soldiers. God provided a miracle, but just not the miracle that was expected. Is it a miracle if it's not Charlton Heston opening up the Red Sea to a totally dry floor underneath? Is it a miracle only if millions of little boats come and not just a few hundred? Is it a miracle if you don't believe it? Is it a miracle if the story as told now isn't exactly as it was back then? I wonder if our cinematic representations of Dunkirk are actually what it looked like and felt like. Because I think it's fair to say that hundreds and thousands of little boats did not arrive all at once. There was not suddenly a great view of them across the channel because that would have sparked um, interest from the Nazis. They arrived just a few at a time. But does that make it any less of a miracle? No, just because things aren't as we imagine them to be does not make them any less of a miracle. Is it a miracle when a prisoner of war can forgive his captor? Yes, it is a miracle, but it's a miracle that no one will ever see and very few of us will ever hear about or know about. But God hears our cries. He always answers prayer, but just not always in the way we expect. Recently, it's called Miracle Workers. I'm not sure whether it's going to be good or not, but I've seen the first couple of episodes. It's set in heaven and it's basically a comedy show where heaven turns out to be like a giant industrial factory estate and they employ different angels. So some of the angels have various mundane and everyday workaday tasks. 
like working on a conveyor belt of tree leaves or creating one millimetre long pieces of dirt or drafting various mutations of moths. But the important top level jobs are angel resources, creation planning, sunset. And the story revolves around one angel called Graham, who works all alone in a dingy basement part of heaven. It hasn't seen an upgrade in, I think, 40 years, and it's the Department of Answered Prayer. The big requests come in and they go direct to God because they're impossible for mere angels to sort. And it turns out in the storyline of the show that God is semi-retired and doesn't bother with them either. But that's that's to one side. One lone angel works in this little basement office at an ancient green screen computer inputting old-fashioned coded cards with answers for prayers. Small prayers. Missing gloves. Keys that have gone awry. And sometimes by melting just one or two snowflakes or moving one or two leaves with a light breeze, you aren't allowed to mess with the laws of physics and nature, he is able to answer prayers. They're not big prayers, but they're important prayers. A new angel arrives in his department and is desperate to solve world peace and hunger and help those suffering with droughts and floods. And by the end of episode one, comes to realise that the wonder and the beauty of the gift of answering prayers is actually in helping people find their gloves and their car keys. That God alone can sort the big stuff. But the smaller miracles where a breeze on a leaf can stop someone slipping, there's huge value and it is still an answered prayer. It's still a miracle. In a month where across the world many have lost homes, livelihoods, lives from massive forest fires in California and Canada, places near our home have struggled with flooding. We need to be careful how we interpret our Exodus story today because miracles happen, but they're not always in the way we expect. Joan Ross is going to read to us the story of the crossing of the Red Sea. This morning's reading is from Exodus chapter 14, beginning at verse 19. The angel of God, who had been in front of the army of Israel, moved and went to the rear. The pillar of cloud also moved until it was between the Egyptians and the Israelites. The cloud made it dark for the Egyptians, but gave light to the people of Israel, and so the armies could not come near each other all night. Moses held out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind. It blew all night and turned the sea into dry land. The water was divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with walls of water on both sides. The Egyptians pursued them and went after them into the sea with all their horses, chariots and drivers. Just before dawn, the Lord took down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw them into a panic. He made the wheels of their chariots get stuck, so that they moved with great difficulty. The Egyptians said, The Lord is fighting for the Israelites against us. Let's go out and get out of here. The Lord said to Moses, Hold out your hand over the sea and the water will come back over the Egyptians and the chariots and drivers. So Moses held out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the water returned to its normal level. The Egyptians tried to escape from the water, but the Lord threw them into the sea. The water returned and covered the chariots, the drivers, and all the Egyptian army that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not of one of them was left. But the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground, with walls of water on both sides. On that day the Lord saved the people of Israel from the Egyptians, and the Israelites saw them lying dead on the seashore. When the Israelites saw the great power with which the Lord had defeated the Egyptians, they stood in awe of the Lord, and they had faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Amen. And thanks be to God for this reading of his holy word. 
as we think about the miracle of the crossing of the Red Sea, we remember that God works in a mysterious way. And that's our opening hymn today. Please join in. story that defines the Jewish people is the exodus, the leaving of Egypt, of which the Passover is part and our story today is part. And it's a story where interpreters have been divided in its understanding for many, many, many years. And even now, people of faith, both Jewish, Islamic and Christian faith, can be confused and separated about how we look at these stories because there are those who believe that we need to read the bible as is that the words in front of us are the words god wants us to have and god doesn't make mistakes so the words that we have are the words one god god wants us to have and we take them literally there are others who believe that the bible is just a mere collection of writings of ancient peoples that have been put together but say nothing about God in this life, only about what ancient people thought that God was. And in between are millions upon millions of everyone else, of which I call myself one, and I'm sure you would call yourself one too. People for whom they're willing to look at translations of Hebrew and Greek and uh, Latin and what does the word really mean? And those who also have a sense that, yes, these are a collection of writings, but they do speak truth to our time and they are important in our time. So wherever you sit on this, that's OK. But we're going to explore our story a little, looking at some of the different advice that we have and some of the different elements to see if it helps us to perhaps explore God's miracle a little bit further. In our Exodus story today, the Hebrew word that is used to describe the number of people leaving Egypt after the Passover is a word called Elif. Now, in Hebrew, Elif can be translated as thousands. It can also equally be translated as household. So how do we know whether there were several hundred households or several hundred thousands? The answer is we don't. We have to guess and we have to use other contextual information to help us surmise this. And if it was just a few hundred households, does that make it any less of a miracle than if the whole hundred thousand had left? It's no less of a miracle 
that God saves his people from Egypt. Of course, the bigger historical question revolves around which body of water it is that they cross. And we may be attached, like I am, to the scene in the Cecil B. DeMille Ten Commandments, where a huge body of water is split with 25 foot banks of water forming a canyon through which almost two million walk. But the truth of the matter is, the Bible doesn't say it was the Red Sea. Well, not the Hebrew texts anyway. The Hebrew texts say that they crossed the Yam Suf, which is the Sea of Reeds, not the Sea of Red. And now how the first Latin translation took Yam Suf and changed it into Merubrum is a puzzle. But the Sea of Reeds sounds much more like Egypt's border. So the deliverance may have been through a shallow body of water, more like a marsh, more like the edges of Forferloch. But does the fact that God led his people through waist-high water, thousands of them of one evening, with their animals and their children, through a busy reed bed, does that change that it was a miracle? Does it stop it being a miracle? Perhaps we need to say, as one Christian who believes in a very literal understanding of the Bible said on learning the Hebrew, how amazing it is then that God drowned the whole entire Egyptian army in such shallow water. It's a miracle nevertheless. The point of the story, the truth of the story that comes through the generations to us is that they took off through a waterlogged marshy area of reeds thought to be impassable by the Egyptians. So impassable that the Egyptians had left that border unattended. And so by some kind of miracle, whether it was an unusually strong wind, whether it pressed water back, whether there was some unusual tidal event, or whether God really did work through the um, staff of Moses, the Hebrew people were able to elude the Egyptian pursuit by making their way through the reeds at that lower tide or when the water was able. But in the panic of crossing the reeds behind them, the Egyptian army got lost. They got caught up in the mud. They veer off into high, longer water. Who knows? But they drown and the Hebrew people escape. It's a miracle. There are two understandings to the one story. One that has been embellished over time. One that's more probable. Which is true. And what is the miracle? When God works little miracles in our midst, are we over keen to minimise them or do we embellish the prayerful input that led to them? Well, we realise the real truth here and the real important teaching from God. It isn't about the destructions of armies. It isn't about which sea was crossed and how. It's about God giving people a new start. Being allowed a fresh start, a clean sheet, a way forward from what bound us behind and before. And that's the miracle. God heard his people's cries. God released them from Egypt. He took them by a different road. He helped them cross over the water that separated them from a clean start and offered them something new and something wonderful. The rabbis of old in retelling this story always were clear that they did not celebrate when the Egyptian army was lost because they too were God's children. We should be careful to have any triumphalist readings of this passage. Because from early on, Jewish leaders recognised there were two sides, two stories. And God's will isn't always for one to win and one to lose. For 
good guys to succeed and the bad guys to be crushed. God's will isn't for me to get the job and someone else to find themselves struggling. But just being offered the new start, that's the miracle. We're all God's children, all of us, Christians and otherwise, and God asks us to forgive each other, to offer each other a fresh sheet, a clean start. Show what we've been shown, show grace, show mercy in a world that doesn't always show that and in doing so let's shine God's light into this world. As we go forward into places in this post lockdown world as things very slowly reopen and places return to normal levels of restrictions over the coming months, as we feel our way in a world that isn't one that we know, that isn't one where we can ever guess the future, God offers us a new start. I wonder when you've had a new start recently. Did you have retirement? Or did you make up with a friend? Have you got back in touch with family after many years? Or have you discovered the joys of Facebook or Zoom to connect in new and different ways? Lockdown has offered many of us a new start, whether it's a new way of doing our school and home life, whether our work has changed, whether it's given us opportunity to think about what's really important going forward. We've been offered a fresh start and God gives us every opportunity to make the most of it, promising to be with us every step of the way, promising to hold back whatever is binding us to the past. And God asks us to offer the same to those around us. So I wonder today, as we take a moment of reflection, what miracles might God do for us if we take our fresh start and we use it to look around us? To take moments in each and every day just to pause, to stop, to just be with God, whether that's in your bath, whether that's in your bed at night, on your sofa during the day, whether it's out for a walk, enjoying the fresh air. But take a moment to see what's going on around us and look for the little miracles. The little miracles that are answered prayers all around us. I wonder what a difference that would make to our new starts. What a difference that would make to transform our lives if we were people who looked out for miracles. And who watched and wondered and gazed in awe at the miracles that God is performing right in front of us each and every day. Amen. Ron McGregor is going to lead us in our prayers for others. Good morning. Please join me in a prayer for others. Dear Father in heaven, your whole world is suffering. People are falling ill. People are dying and sometimes alone with no family permitted to be with them. People are afraid, afraid of catching this killer virus, afraid for members of their family, afraid of being alone, afraid of losing their job or worse, afraid that they cannot feed their family. Not one of us has experienced anything like this before and we are all afraid. But although this pandemic concerns us all, please also be with those who are in desperate need of your love and strength in their daily life. Those who are stricken, those who are ill, those who are afraid and those who mourn. Dear God, there are people starting or undergoing hospital treatment at this difficult time. 
and some of them are more scared of catching the virus in hospital than they are of the disease they have. Please give your blessing to all those fighting a disease. Father, we pray for your people around the world. Give them the strength to carry on in the sure and certain knowledge that you are with them. Please draw close to all who need you and be with them all, now and forever. Dear God, we ask those things in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Our closing praise today is O God, our help in ages past and our hope for years to come. for joining us for worship today. I hope that you find miracles in your everyday life. I hope you see answered prayer all around you. I hope whether you have an image of the Red Sea that's much more a deep water parting with whales looking on on either side or whether it's a reed bed with shoulder length water or knee length water. It doesn't matter really. The story is about God's new start, so I hope this week you find a new start in whatever it is and wherever your life is going just now, whether it's a new Sudoku book or a new daily crossword, whether that new start is getting back in touch with an old friend or a colleague, whether it's picking up the phone to chat with a person who used to sit next to you in church just to find out how they're doing. I wish you a new start. I hope you're safe. I hope you're well. And I hope that you stay in the love of God. I look forward to seeing you in person at church sometime if you're able. And if not, I'll see you around town. But in the meantime, may God bless you with a new start each and every day. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit 
be with you and those whom you love for this day and for evermore. Amen. <laughs>